So the otherness of things, the uncanny, the strange, the unfamiliar, uh, these are phrases often heard today and especially maybe in relation to contemporary archaeology. But uh, I guess the main idea or spark behind this session uh, on the familiar and strange in archaeological mediation is that both Stain and I work on uh, material that we find rather strange. Um, Stain uh, works on an abandoned landscape garden and the strangely wild afterlife of cultivated plants. And I myself work on drift beaches uh, and the strange trajectories of things in drift outside the human realm. Um, and while it may be rightfully argued that an analytical archaeological gaze like ours can make the most mundane and familiar appear unfamiliar and bring to question what before had seemed obvious, I think both we both agree that there is also a strangeness and an unfamiliarity uh, to the things we work with and which becomes released, so to say, in our encounter with them and even before any uh, such analytical probing. Things themselves also behave oddly and are at times simply strange. So what we were not least interested in was to discuss how this otherness of things appears or is encountered, how it could be dealt with through archaeological research, uh, how it could be contained or prolonged through mediation, uh, and how this would comply with doing archaeology, which more often than not is a means of bringing things close and making them and the past uh, more knowable and more accessible and less strange, maybe. So following this, we also wanted to ask basically what does uh, knowing things really imply? Does it necessarily involve making sense of them in a traditional interpretive manner and through processes of naming and categorization and typology and systematic uh, reordering? Or can the parameters of archaeological knowledge production and mediation involve something entirely different from that? And if so, why would that be important? Why would uh, retaining otherness uh, be of importance for archaeology? And uh, for one, and as uh, Paul Graves Brown here uh, has also argued, and as we uh, referenced in the abstract for this session, um, it may be significant is significant because otherness and a sense of mystery or the uncanny is what stimulates imagination. It is what drives our curiosity and our wonder. In that sense, striving to retain otherness or not to reduce or exhaust things through interpretation may appear of significance not only to the archaeological project itself but also to archaeological outreach and to museum uh, education and so forth. Importantly, this is not to return, uh, I argue, to a problematic association between archaeology and discovery, uh, because rather than claiming that it is the discovery that drives, it, this is rather saying that it is the quest itself, the engagement with things and their otherness that motivates and initiates. We might even say that uh, it enlightens the core and the rhythm of archaeological epistemology and its deep relation to our throne condition, as Heidegger would call it, our being in the world, basically, and being towards things. Another reason for paying attention to the otherness of things is, of course, that something may be learned from otherness itself, that retaining the distance, so to speak, may in fact be part of bringing things close uh, and making them known that uh, otherness may, may be informative of their being, uh, and of being generally, even. In a text on, uh, scientific, on scientific method, historian Carlo Ginzburg uh, said that reality is opaque, but there are certain points and clues and signs that allow us to decipher it. And that's what science is about. This sounds quite plausible, and this is also what archaeological inquiry uh, is often all about, about making sense of uh, a fragmented archaeological record. 
However, it is also possible that the unruliness of the archaeological record isn't simply a result of uh, post-depositional or post-abandonment processes uh, of fragmentation and degradation and so forth, uh, and therefore only needs to be put right in order to become sensible again. Um, The unruliness may also manifest an aspect of things being. It may hint at an understanding of the archaeological record as always already truly mixed, unruly and even uncanny, and that this, in a sense, is what constitute the ex- constitutes the existential condition for uh, any being, including human being, uh, also in the past. And this is something that has been a central concern in my own research on subarctic drift beaches and drift material, which is basically stuff floating around in the ocean and washing ashore. Um, and this is a material that uh, is extremely mixed of both natural and cultural components uh, and it's gathering in places that are far removed from human settlements and far far away from any uh, urban centers it has spent a long time sometimes even most of its lifetime uh, in drift uh, and therefore also outside of any direct meaningful relations to human beings Um, But it has, through its journey and gathering, established and also been dependent on various other relations. For example, with drift ice and currents and kelp and sunlight and the moon's gravity, even. And the origin of this material is often unknown, and so is also the original function of these things. It doesn't answer well to the category of waste, though it's often referred to as such, and much of the material here uh, hasn't has probably never belonged to that category. So generally speaking, uh, also the material is not representative of socio-cultural conditions at the place it is found. Uh, So in all aspects, this material is very strange, uh, and not least so when approached as traditional archaeological material. It simply does not obey to its logic. So the interesting thing is that uh, trying to make sense of this material through any conventional archaeological or culture-historical approach uh, only estranges the material even more. Of course, this assemblage can be ordered through uh, categorization and things origins uh, and functions may be, uh, in some cases at least, be re-established. But the assemblage as such really doesn't answer to a deciphered, purified past or a present uh, of that kind either. Rather, uh, the truth uh, and the message of this material is in its mixed, uh, in the mixed mess itself, in unruliness. Uh, and therefore, trying to reduce the unruliness and otherness of some to some abstract order actually risks missing the whole point. Um, for example, the frightening environmental message that this uh, assemblage communicates. Um, <clears throat> so this was uh, just a short example, maybe an extreme example, uh, of the significance of otherness uh, and of the seemingly strange. And also, uh, I used the opportunity to squeeze in my own research here, though very briefly. Uh, But I'm sure that we will uh, hear today many other examples of strange things um, and uh, that we will be able to discuss them also, though briefly. Um, So without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, our first speaker here today, which is Paul Grace Brown. We're very happy to have you here. He is someone who has uh, uh, written a little bit about strange things. uh, we are uh, inspired by you. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome. 